some of the attendees today are also students, including first year law students. So I'll do a fairly basic introduction to investment arbitration. And from there on, we'll discuss some of the cases and get into the weeds of uh, investment arbitration and particularly ICSID arbitration. We'll discuss the various stages of dispute resolution before the ICSID where corruption claims can be brought. Uh, we'll discuss how those claims can actually succeed in that what is the evidentiary threshold required to be met uh, for a successful corruption claim. And we'll round that off with uh, some strategic considerations from and some acad academic um, ideas that you can explore a bit further if you're, if you're interested in the issue. Now, um, Corruption is something we read about in papers and we, we talk about a lot, but uh, in order to ground our discussion today, we need to sort of understand what kind of corruption we're referring to for the context and purposes of uh, investment arbitration claims. Um, you, you'll see from our discussion today, and perhaps you, you would know already that there are a number of cases that involve corruption allegations, but most of these tribunals or very few of these tribunals have actually attempted to define corruption. I think a lot of institutions have, have, have uh, had a stab at it. For example, the World Bank considers corruption to be uh, the abuse of public office for private gain. Transparency International, which is one of the leading NGOs govern, uh, sort of researching corruption and providing disaggregated data on corruption, uh, also define it in similar terms. They call it the abuse of entrusted power for private gain. Um, the slide that you've got, that we've got on screen right now is the 2018 map that's been produced uh, by Transparency International. It's, it's got a color coded map of the world sort of highlighting countries where uh, corruption is um, more prevalent than, than other countries. The red is obviously the countries uh, that are considered to have uh, quite some corruption in their public offices and so on. And the, the yellows are uh, obviously doing better. Um, if you look at the scale at the bottom, it tells you the scores that are assigned, the lower your score, the worse the corruption is. And the global average for corruption right now is at uh, 43, I think, uh, of 100. And India falls at about 41. Uh, us, India scores about 41 on the corruption index, so not, uh, so could be better. Um, and the World Bank uh, uh, reports as of 2018 that US dollars, 1.5 trillion are paid each year by way of bribes, which accounts for about 2% of the global GDP. And there are other reports that say that it's, a, it's at about 5% of the global GDP. Now, this is all to say that corruption is a pretty significant problem in most commercial transactions, and they feature increasingly in dispute resolution claims. And we'll talk about how they feature in investment arbitration claims uh, this evening. Um, this slide is simply meant to give you an overview of some of the leading cases involving corruption. Uh, The first category are cases where parties have succe succeeded in their corruption allegations. And there's two very well-known cases. They're called World Duty Free versus Kenya and Metal Tech versus Uzbekistan. And the other cases uh, have typically failed in their, uh, in, their, in their corruption allegations. Before we move on, let's talk about where these cases actually took place um, for, the, for the benefit of, uh, of, of those who aren't familiar with investment arbitration. In cases where uh, foreign investors have made an investment in a different country, their investment and the investor is protected under, typically under investment treaties. They may be bilateral investment treaties or multilateral investment treaties. In some cases, they may be protected by investment contracts. When they're protected by investment treaties, those treaties contain a number of uh, investment protection standards or investor protection standards. For example, there's the guarantee of fair and equitable treatment by the host state. There's the guarantee of full protection and security for the investment. Um, there's also the guarantee of national treatment and most favored nation treatment for the investment and so on. If an investor is then 
is it finds finds if an investor finds uh, themselves mired in disputes as a result of uh, a breach of these investment protection standards, they can bring disputes typically in the national courts of that state. But because they're also protected by an investment agreement, they can bring a claim uh, in investment arbitration either before the ICSID or in ad hoc arbitration under the UNCITRA rules or before the PCA or any other institution that's actually listed in the investment, uh, in the investment treaty. In most of the cases that we discussed, that we will discuss today with the, with the notable exception, I think of world duty free, claims have been brought uh, before the ICSID and they've been brought under investment, uh, investment treaties and therefore there's they're accompanied by a whole host of investor and investment protection standards uh, that, that protect these investors and investments from corruption. And we'll discuss how those, how, how the investment treaty plays out um, in those allegations as well. Um, this, the legal framework for a corruption allegation is typically dependent on whether the investment well, it's not dependent, but it usually involves an analysis of whether the investment treaty contains an in accordance with law provision. And that typically means that investment treaties often require an investment to have been made in accordance with the laws of the host state in order to avail of treaty protections, which means in this context, if the investment has been made or procured through corruption, then there is an arguable basis for a party to say that the, that the investor and the investment are not entitled to the protections of the treaty because the treaty protection was conditional upon their investment being made in compliance with host state laws. Um, even in the absence of, uh, of, of such a clause or such a provision in the investment treaty, parties are known to make corruption allegations and we'll get into that as well. For the next little bit, I'll, I'll analyze the different stages at which uh, a corruption claim can be brought. Uh, they can be brought during the jurisdictional stage, which means that a party can use a corruption allegation to say that the other part, uh, that, the, that the investor or, or the state, depending on, on the facts of the particular case, to, to basically argue that the exit tribunal, for example, does not have jurisdiction because the investment was tainted by illegality. That's a jurisdictional objection that's based on corruption. Alternatively, uh, corruption allegations can be used to resist the admissibility of a claim, which means that the tribunal does have jurisdiction, but it should not hear the claim on the merits because it's not admissible as a result of uh, the corruption allegation. And the last category or uh, the last broader category, I think would be claims that are brought um, as a result of uh, a breach on the merits and so on, and as defenses and so on. It's also relevant uh, to a number of tribunals analysis, whether the cor corruption took place at, in the making of the investment, as in uh, whether, the contract, uh, whether the contract or the investment was procured as a result of bribery or other forms of illegality or alternatively, whether the illegality occurred during the lifetime of the investment. And uh, we'll see why shortly. The first category of a jurisdictional objection based on corruption uh, can be understood with regard and is based typically with, uh, on, 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 on the language of, of an investment treaty. We have here uh, on the screen, uh, the, language, the text of the Indian model uh, BIT of 2016, where the BIT requires an investment uh, to be organized and made in compliance, organized and operated in compliance with the law of the host state and be owned and controlled in good faith by an investor. Now, typically, if a foreign investor were to sue India under this clause, uh, India could typically argue that the investment ought to have been made in compliance with host state laws, which means that there can be no corruption in the, in the making of the investment and in the operation of the in investment, which means the investor and the investment cannot have been corrupt in the making of the investment and in the lifetime of the investment. And the investment ought to be 
uh, made in good faith by the investor. Now, good faith is a fairly ambiguous term and uh, the scope of that has not been explored or identified or delineated conclusively by investment arbitration tribunals. And this is likely to lead to a lot of interesting jurisprudence and interesting arguments being made by parties. The scope of that uh, will remain to be seen. What's more common, I think, is the second example you've got on screen, which is the language uh, in the Colombian BIT, which only requires the investment to have been made in compliance with host state laws. And I've got an extract as well from CESA versus El Salvador, where the tribunal said that in the event that an investor or an investment um, has been corrupt in the making of the investment, uh, then they're precluded from seeking the jurisdiction of an investment arbitration tribunal because of the illegality uh, that has tainted uh, the jurisdiction itself. And that's the basis on which a number of arguments are going to be made. We'll discuss these cases uh, in detail, but this is just so you have context for the arguments that are likely to be made. A second category of jurisdictional objection includes um, includes cases where the underlying investment treaty doesn't actually have a requirement that the investment be made in accordance with law, which means that the state has not expressly required an investment to be made strictly in compliance with its laws in order to avail of treaty protections. It doesn't mean that the investor can't be held liable before national courts or another or another dispute resolution fora. It only means that this, is, this cannot possibly uh, be considered to be a jurisdictional requirement. However, even in these cases where it's not a treaty requirement, a number of claimants have in fact um, made the argument that there is an implied, required, implied requirement in international law uh, that requires an investor to have made their investment in compliance with post state laws, uh, where, where, tri where tribunals should not be seen to protect investments that are made in violation of post state laws or to protect investments that are not made in good faith. Uh, you, can, you can review Phoenix Action and Plama versus Bulgaria if you're interested in this line of argument, but I think the stronger, uh, stronger line of authority indicates that, uh, and in particular for exit jurisdiction, in order to avail of the jurisdiction of uh, an exit tribunal, all you have to do is meet the requirements of Article 25 of the Exit Convention, and a tribunal cannot actually read in these additional criteria, such as um, compliance with host state laws into, into, into the treaty itself, because that's, that's going too far. This is an extract from uh, some of fakes versus Turkey that you can also look at if you, if you would like to explore that argument a bit further. I'm going to spend the next little while sort of uh, framing our discussion in a few cases. So you have concrete examples of, uh, of what is meant by uh, a jurisdictional objection. Um, Metal Tech versus Uzbekistan is one of two uh, very well-known cases on this issue. In Metal Tech, um, in early 2000, uh, an Israeli company, Metal Tech, entered into, uh, entered into uh, a JV with two Israeli sorry, to is Uzbekistan state-owned entities to construct, operate, and um, manufacture molybdenum products. Uh, this case is a bit different because there was, uh, as you will see, there was an obvious, uh, there was obvious evidence of corruption. A few years into the JV company's existence, the public prosecutor of Tashkent initiated criminal proceedings against the JV company's officials. Shortly thereafter, the Uzbekistan cabinet adopted a resolution which abrogated the JV company's right to produce and export molybdenum products. Shortly thereafter, the state-owned entities uh, which, uh, which, which, were, which were part of the companies which made the JV company the state-owned entities demanded dividends from the JV company, which, which it was obviously unable to pay because of, uh, because of the measures that we just discussed that the cabinet had adopted, and which led to bankruptcy proceedings being instituted and the eventual liquidation of the JV company. Metal Tech, which is the Israeli foreign investor, filed a claim uh, before the exit 
um, in exit arbitration to argue that the investment was not made in accordance with uh, uh, that, that the acquisition of uh, the assets of the JV company violated the terms of the Israel Uzbekistan BIT and they made a number of arguments uh, supporting supporting that contention. Uzbekistan naturally objected to the jurisdiction of the exit tribunal on the basis that the investment was not made in accordance with the laws of Uzbekistan and was therefore not an investment which was protected under the BIT. In this case, uh, the tribunal uh, found that the investment was procured by the corrupt payment of about $4, four million dollars to Uzbekistan public officials. And the tribunal relied upon what's known as red flags. Now you'll see the red flags being relied upon on a regular, on a regular basis in a number of cases where uh, they're used by parties alleging corruption to argue that uh, there are sufficient indicia of corruption in the facts of that particular case. The red flags are based on Lord Wolf's um, report, which, which, which was produced in 2008, analyzing business ethics and so forth, um, of the base systems. And you can, you can review that separately because it will give you some context. And it found that um, it found that the claimant in this case had paid four million was uh, four million dollars to the prime minister's brother and to someone in the president's office on the basis of consultancy agreements. Uh, on, the, on, on the evidence before it, uh, the tribunal concluded that the claimant had basically accepted that the bribes were actually paid, that the amounts were paid for undefined consultancy services, which constituted about 20% of the investment consideration, so a very, very large amount. And the claimant had failed to actually provide proof of any consultancy services that were actually provided. And the consultants themselves lacked any actual qualifications. They actually just sort of represented themselves and as lobbyists um, with the Uzbekistan government. So it was clear to the tribunal that the agreements were actually a sham. And so to that extent, this, this, this case is quite different from a number of other cases because it presents very clear evidence of corruption, which is not, which is not common um, because the nature of corruption is that uh, the evidence of it is quite uh, unavailable, quite uncommon and quite difficult to get a hold of. The tribunal therefore declined jurisdiction because the investment had not been made in accordance uh, with the laws and regulation of Uzbekistan and therefore did not satisfy the requirements that are set out in Article 8.1 of the Israel-Uzbekistan BIT. The claimant also, um, for those of you who are familiar with, with, with the MFN argument, uh, the claimant also tried to optimistically rely upon the MFN clause in the Israel-Uzbekistan BIT to sort of incorporate a more favorable clause from the Greece-Uzbekistan BIT to argue that the legality requirement in the Israel-Uzbekistan BIT should, should, be, should be dropped in favor of the in favor of the more favorable clause in the Greece. Uzbekistan BIT, but tribunal didn't actually accept that argument at all. Um, now you're probably thinking um, about how it was how the bribe was actually solicited by the state's officials, and the state is still able to rely upon the the fact of the corruption in its uh, in. In, in its arguments in investment arbitration. And that's something that the tribunal was sensitive to as well. The tribunal recognized that the outcome might be a bit unfair in that it allowed the state to benefit uh, from the misconduct of its own officials. And it actually held, uh, it, it observed that the findings on corruption often come down heavily on the claimants while possibly exonerating the respondent state that may have uh, been involved in the corrupt act. The tribunal noted that the idea of, uh, of this is not to penalize or punish one party at the cost of another, but simply to ensure uh, that the exit mechanism or the investment arbitration mechanism more generally is only used to promote the rule of law rather than uh, to protect investors or investments that were made uh, through illegality or corruption. But the tribunal did take account of Uzbekistan's role in the corruption itself by requiring each party to bear its own costs, because even though the claimants failed and the natural uh, way forward would have been 
for costs to follow the consequences of, uh, of the proceedings, the tribunal required Uzbekistan to uh, bear, bear, bear its own costs. And, and that's, that's the tribunal's way of sort of uh, balancing the equities to some, to some extent. Now, it's not every legality that can actually satisfy the threshold of corruption required to be proved. The illegality, as the Lessee versus Algeria tribunal put it, must be must be fundamental, must be, must be a significant violation of fundamental principles of the whole state laws. And as the Tokyo tribunal put it, it can't simply be a minor error or, or a mere technicality. Uh, it must be something fundamental. Um, the Fraport Tribunal actually took a, a slightly different approach and considered a different criteria, which was basically uh, analyzing whether the legality was central to the profitability of the investment or whether the, the, the investor could have made the investment lawfully without uh, any loss of, of profitability. Uh, that's not something I personally have seen in too many other cases, but may be interesting to review uh, on, your, uh, on your own time. Now, this was an example, what we just finished was an example of corruption being used to resist jurisdiction. We'll now discuss a different case where corruption is being used as a bar to admissibility, which means it's not, it doesn't displace the jurisdiction of the tribunal, but requires the tribunal not to, dis, not to entertain the claim on the merits because it's not admissible as a result of the corruption. World duty free versus Kenya is another really important case because it was it's, it's regarded widely as being the first publicly known case where the tribunal made a dispositive finding of corruption. In this case, there was an agreement that was entered into between world duty free and, uh, and Kenya for the construction, maintenance and operation of duty free, duty -free complexes at uh, the Mombasa and Nairobi airports in, in, in Kenya. The agreement was uh, governed by, the agreement itself was governed by Kenyan law, but a tribunal constituted under that agreement was to apply English law. So it's a slightly different structure than you're used to. And this case is not a BIT case. It's actually a, a jurisdiction of an exit tribunal actually flows from the contract. Again, this case like metal tech is a bit different because it was uncontested that a bribe was in fact actually paid, uh, paid to President Moy of Kenya in order to be able to do business um, in, in, in the state. Um, Nasir Ali, who is the manager or the CEO, I think, of, of World Duty Free, uh, was asked to make a $2 million personal, personal donation to President Moy of Kenya. And he was asked, this bribe was actually solicited by one Mr. Rashid Sajjad, who, who is known by Mr. Ali to, to be close to the president and to have uh, quite some sway within the Kenyan government. This here is an extract on the slide from the witness statement of Mr. Nasir Ali, where he basically admits uh, to, to paying that amount. What happened was, and it's quite, uh, it's quite, a, it's quite an interesting cash for corn exchange where uh, Mr. Ali and Mr. Sajjad went to have a meeting with, the, with President Moy of Kenya and they brought with them a big briefcase full of cash, $2 million worth of cash, that they left um, in the room by, uh, by the wall while they, had the meeting, while they had the meeting with the president. Having finished with that and left with the meeting, they picked up their briefcase and walked out of the room and um, realized, Mr. Ali observes here, that he realized that the cash was swapped for corn and he, he admits that it made him uncomfortable. Uh, the idea of making this personal donation uh, to President Moy made him uncomfortable, but he understood that uh, making this donation uh, to the Hedam was uh, the cost of doing business in Kenya and was a routine aspect of business in Kenya. Parties made uh, the arguments on corruption, as you can see on the slide. The respondent argued that the payment of the bribe by the claimant was unenforceable and without force of law, both in Kenyan law and in English law, and that it also violated international public policy. The claimants, of course, made the arguments that we've just discussed. Mr. Ali considered the claimant to be lawful and as part of the cultural system called Harambe in Kenya, uh, 
uh, and the bribe itself was uh, a collateral contract that was made prior to from prior to the main contract and was therefore severable from the actual contract for the investment itself. They also made other more uh, specific arguments about how the violation of public policy was not a ground for dismissal of a claim in investment arbitration. And if the tribunal actually allowed that, they would be permitting Kenya to get away from its own, get away with its own uh, unlawful conduct. Having heard these arguments, it was still clear to the tribunal that uh, the payment was not a personal was not a personal donation. It was in fact nothing nothing but a bribe. And the tribunal then examined the consequences of the bribery itself. Uh, the tribunal considered that paying of bribes was contrary to the laws in Kenya and to English laws as well, and to the laws and public policy to international public policy of most, um, if not all, states. And so it was the tribunal's, tribunal's view that this was fairly dispositive of the case and they could have stopped there. But what they did was they went on to examine the contract uh, under domestic law and considered that the fact of the corruption made the contract voidable at the election of the injured party. In this case, it would be Kenya. So they concluded that the contract was voidable at the election of Kenya and Kenya had actually exercised their right to void the contract in their submissions in the counter memorial. And they accepted that and allowed for that, uh, for the contract to be voided on that basis. Uh, and they argued that the severability of the arbitration agreement meant that uh, the tribunal's jurisdiction was established in this case, but it would, it, they refused, uh, refused to entertain the claim on the basis of the admissibility, uh, the admissibility prong. What's interesting about this case and what's not, what's not common in a lot of other cases is that the tribunal specifically considered the point um, of attribution. They considered whether, uh, sorry, one side. They considered whether President Moy's uh, conduct was actually attributable to Kenya. And you would think so because he is the president and he acts for the state and his conduct should in fact be attributable to the state. He shouldn't be allowed to get away with it. But what the tribunal reasoned was that um, the fact of the corruption was covert and the state was not actually aware of President Moy acting uh, in his capacity as president surely, but for private gain. And it was not actually known to the state and um, and on that basis, it could not be attributed to Kenya. Like in Metal Tech, however, the tribunal attempted to sort of balance the equities of parties by requiring the claimant uh, and the respondent to bear their own costs in this case. So just, just to sort of round that up, the tribunal concluded that it did have jurisdiction, but just rejected the claim uh, on admissibility. For those of you who are interested in this issue and would like to explore it a bit more, it's going to be very useful to review some of the pieces by Professor Douglas on the issue on the plea of illegality in investment arbitration. And this is a table that he includes in that, in that piece, which is extracted here on the slide. Professor Douglas notes, uh, similar to the Savafakes case that we just looked at, that to meet the jurisdictional threshold in, invest, in investor state arbitration, an investment must only be required by, only be acquired by a foreign national and must have obtained legal interest in those assets under the laws of the whole state. Nothing further technically is required for jurisdiction. However, to argue that a contravention of international public policy, which is abbreviated on this slide as IPP, uh, to argue that a contravention of international public policy operates as a bar to admissibility in, in two limited cases. The first is uh, when the investment is procured by illicit means or when the investment is procured for an illicit purpose. In all other cases, uh, the issue must be dealt with as a substantive matter of the merits or uh, or, or, or as a defense, but just not uh, for the purpose of jurisdiction or admissibility. Now, these are, we've discussed two of the main arguments, uh, 
for jurisdiction and admissibility, but corruption can also uh, be brought as a claim in a number of other contexts. Um, for example, in World Duty Free uh, versus Kenya, which we just discussed, the cash for con case, World Duty Free also uh, made an affirmative claim that extortion or the solicitation of bribes by public officials is evidence of a violation of the fair and equitable treatment standard or um, the international standard of protection. This has also, this, this kind of argument has also been made in a number of other cases, including in EDF versus, uh, versus Romania. In EDF versus Romania, EDF entered into uh, Sorry, I just, yeah. Uh, in EDF versus Roma Romania, EDF alleged that Romania's measures were a response to EDF's refusal to pay um, bribes in the amount of US dollars 2.5 million, which were actually solicited by the Romanian prime minister. That tribunal recognized that this could be an argument that, 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 that could be validly raised as a substantive breach, but uh, breach of the FED standard because it was a, a breach of the fair and equitable treatment uh, that was guaranteed under a BIT and it would be unfair for a state to actually solicit bribes from an investor in such a fashion. So the state recognized, uh, the tribunal, sorry, recognized the validity of um, a corruption claim being made in the context of a substantive breach, but they simply found that there was uh, not sufficient evidence in that case of, uh, of corruption itself. So it can be raised as a substantive breach. Another context where it has been raised in the past is in Siemens versus Argentina, which is another case before an exit tribunal. Uh, this case was raised, in this case, the claim was raised much later when uh, the tribunal had already rendered its award and the proceedings were actually at the annulment stage. Uh, Argentina raised this ground after some German newspapers leaked testimony uh, by Siemens uh, officials who admitted to have having who admitted to have actually paid bribes in the amount of 97 million US dollars to secure the contract. So um, the making of, uh, of of the investment through corruption was was a fact. But that 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 dispute never actually that claim never actually got analyzed at length because uh, parties settled that dispute fairly quickly after that allegation was raised by Argentina in annulment proceedings. Um, having now looked at the various stages um, in which corruption allegations may be brought by parties, both claimants and respondent states, I think it's important to spend some time just talking about what is actually required in order to succeed uh, in a corruption claim. Now the evidentiary uh, standard of proof that's required to be met, uh, there's a lot of jurisprudence available both in civil uh, and then especially in common law countries um, that fraud and corruption uh, are required to be proved to a higher standard of proof. It can't, um, it's, it's, not the usual, uh, it's not the usual argument. Now that hasn't been considered very much at length by an investment arbitration tribunal. What's for certain is that there are a number of incons inconsistent decisions that have been passed by a number of, in of investment arbitration tribunals. Um, for example, in Fraport versus Philippines and in Libanco versus Turkey, the arbitral tribunals were required the party alleging corruption to prove it on a balance of probability standard or a preponderance of evidence standard, which is a civil law uh, standard for claims made um, uh, for claims made across across jurisdictions. In EDF versus Romania, which we just discussed, and in SIAG versus Egypt, the tribunals required the party alleging corruption to prove it uh, with clear and convincing evidence. Now that's naturally quite hard to do because as we as we all know corruption typically takes place uh, behind closed doors under under the table under the metaphorical table and it's it's typically very hard to gather evidence of corruption and usually the evidence of corruption 
is in the possession of the party that's actually been responsible for the corruption or that's taken advantage of, uh, of the corruption. And it's quite difficult to adduce evidence that meets this high standard of clear and convincing evidence. In metal tech as well, which we've, which we've just reviewed, the tribunal required um, Uzbekistan to establish the corruption claim um, on a reasonable certainty standard. There are other views as well, such as in Binder versus Pakistan, where the tribunal required the evidence uh, to be to, to sufficiently exclude any reasonable doubt. Um, reasonable, the exclusion of reasonable doubt is uh, more akin to a criminal standard uh, rather than a civil law standard. So, so it's obvious from, from a number of cases on the issue that the standard of proof is quite high and it places a heavy burden on the party alleging corruption. It's insufficient to just make the allegation and support it with prima facie evidence. Another argument uh, to be made is, uh, is on burden of proof. Um, now typically, and it's a well-known fact across jurisdictions that the party making an allegation must prove it and it bears the burden of establishing that fact through the forensic process. This was actually held by the wrong petrol tribunal. It's not on the slide, but you can look at it. And the tribunal basically explained that it's quite, uh, it's complicating matters to actually talk about the shifting of the burden of proof in this context, because the burden of proof actually just stays with the party that bears it through the forensic process. And it's very rare, and especially so in investment arbitration, that the, tri the tribunals have actually consented to shift the burden of proof. It's, it's, it's very rare, and it's very rare because, and especially in this context, for, in the context of illegality and corruption, it's rare because prima facie evidence is simply insufficient to actually meet, meet that threshold. Uh, some tribunals, like in the case of Metal Tech uh, versus Uzbekistan, they've actually um, they, they give rise to uh, the possibility of calling upon tribunals to make adverse inferences, and it may be maybe the interest in the interests of parties to, to sort of rely upon that principle rather than the shifting of burden of proof principle, because a tribunal is allowed to draw adverse inferences. And uh, for example, Article 9.5 of the IBA rules on the taking of evidence provides that if a party fails uh, without satisfactory explanation to, pro to produce a document that it has been ordered to produce by the arbitral tribunal, the arbitral tribunal may infer that such a document would be adverse to the interests of that party. Now, if proof of evidence if, if proof, sorry, if proof of uh, the corruption itself is with the party against whom that allegation is, is made, and that party has refused to disclose those documents in the course of uh, in the course of disclosure, the counterparty may actually invite the tribunal to draw adverse inferences from from that refusal to produce documents, and that may be a stronger uh, argument and stronger footing to stand on rather than making the argument about shifting the burden of proof. Um, especially in these kinds of in these kinds of cases. Um, before moving on, and this was, uh, I think, I think it's important also uh, to consider in this context, how how to structure a claim and what jurisprudence exists on structuring a corruption claim. And I think uh, the Nico versus Bangladesh case, which we uh, it was on the slide, but we didn't actually get into that. So I'll, I'll briefly explain the facts of that one. Um, in Nico versus Bangladesh, disputes arose between Nico and um, two Bangladesh state-owned entities, which is BAPEX, which is the Bangladesh Petroleum and Exploration Company, and Petrobangla. What happened in that case was that Nico entered into negotiations in the late 1990s and in the early 2000s early to 2000s uh, to explore marginal gas fields in Bangladesh. And uh, the negotiation pr process was fairly long and quite unfavorable uh, to NECO because in the end, I think Bangladesh stayed firm on its, uh, on its terms and the contract was signed significantly favoring Bangladesh um, in about mid 2000s. Disputes arose in this case because uh, because of Petrobangla's non-payment of about $35, $35 million that were owed 
to Nico, allegedly owed to Nico, under the gas purchase, uh, gas purchase and supply agreement. And Nico was also um, sued by Petro Bangla, I think, before uh, the Bangladeshi courts for its alleged role in, in an explosion during, during the drilling process. Now, the corruption allegations were brought up by Bangladesh in this case in the course of investment arbitration on the basis of alleged corruption by Nico's parent company. What had happened was that uh, Nico's Canadian parent company gifted the Bangladesh Bangladeshi Minister for Energy, I think, a Toyota Land Cruiser and paid for an all expenses uh, trip uh, to Calgary uh, to attend an oil, oil and gas conference as a guest of NICO. These facts were fairly, were fairly clear and admitted by NICO uh, in a plea bargain that was signed in Canada in proceedings that were instituted in Canada against uh, NICO's parent company. But in that case, corruption was actually, the tribunal found the corruption to, to, to be fairly impossible because uh, the news of the corruption broke fairly quickly in Bangladesh and the energy minister stepped down as a result of the corruption allegations. And the deal was actually signed between NICO and uh, the Bangladeshi companies, uh, Bangladeshi uh, state-owned enterprises about 18 months after the corrupt minister had received those uh, that bribe. Now the respondent didn't argue in that case that the agreement was void, like, like in the case of World Duty Free. It was only an argument that was based on unclean hands. They basically said, Nico can't bring this claim in arbitration because they themselves have been involved in corruption. And in, it was in that context that the tribunal considered uh, the consequences of corruption and distinguished uh, between a contract for corruption and a contract obtained by corruption. The tribunal said that a contract for corruption was clearly illegal and would clearly operate as a bar uh, to jurisdiction, but that was less so for a contract obtained by corruption, which means, which means that in, this, in, in the latter category, the tribunal would have to analyze uh, how the corruption actually affected the agreement to arbitrate and which aspects of the investment it actually affected. So the tribunal is... Uh, has provided this analysis of when the corruption took place and what the corruption actually affected. And I think it's the, this analysis may uh, is likely to inform any future allegations of corruption that are made by other, other parties going forward. And that's something for you to look at as well. It was, um, it was not a public decision. It was made public only sometime late last year. And it's, it's worth reviewing in its entirety because it canvasses the entire uh, jurisprudence on corruption and is quite uh, a robust analysis of the law um, in force at the time. What's very interesting, and this is for anybody out here who's interested in PIL and would like to dig into this a bit further. What's very interesting, is that a lot of these investment arbitration tribunals have been very reluctant to actually attribute the conduct of these state officials to the state, the state officials who have been corrupt or who've solicited bribes or otherwise uh, participated in, in, in illegality of some sort. Now, under the, under the articles for state responsibility, the, the articles for the responsibility of states uh, for internationally wrongful acts, it's fairly clear that the conduct of state organs are attributable to a state. Now, state officials fall within the scope of state organs, which means that, for example, in the case of World Duty Free, where the president is involved in the corruption, surely that's attributable uh, to the state. Tribunals have attempted to distinguish between, um, uh, distinguish that attribution on the basis that uh, the fact of the corruption uh, or the, corrupt, the, the, the soliciting of the bribe to, was covert and the state couldn't possibly have known uh, that the bribe was being solicited. And it is, for, it is for arguments based on that line of, uh, that line of analysis that tribunals have been reluctant to attribute conduct. But, but if you go back to the articles and the commentary for the articles on state responsibility, it's fairly clear that the articles don't distinguish between high level um, ministers or lower, lower level officials of states and states are equally responsible for the conduct of high officials and lower officials, provided that those officials are acting in their official capacity. And that is, is arguably, that is arguably the test for attribution. 
those arguments, if made more effectively and made more persuasively, and on the basis of a number of uh, decisions that already exist in the public international law space, including uh, before the Iran-US Claims Tribunal or the Mexico-US Mixed Claims Tribunal and so on, it's fairly clear that the conduct of state officials is attributable to the states and it shouldn't matter whether the corruption is covert or overt. All that should matter is whether uh, that public official is in fact acting in their capacity as representatives of the state. And that might be something interesting for you to look at um, as you research the issue a bit more. And that concludes my presentation for today. Um, I, hope, I hope it was useful and uh, I'm happy to take any questions that, that you may have so far. Um, everyone can post their questions on the um, Zoom chat and I'll be reading them out to Mr. May. So our first question is, in case the jurisdiction objection succeeds, then what remedies are available to the party? Um, what party do you mean? Do you mean the state, uh, the state making the jurisdictional objection or to the claimant? The claimant, okay. Um, so if the claimant fails on jurisdiction, they don't have a remedy in investment arbitration. They can, of course, pursue claims available before the national courts, but there may be a bar to that as well, because a lot of investment treaties have a fork in the road clause, which means that uh, parties are typically required to elect uh, for one of two for one of two courses. If they choose to go before the national uh, national courts, then that typically closes the door for them in investment arbitration. But if they choose to go in investment arbitration, such as in these cases, then that often closes uh, the door to national national courts for, the, for that party. So depending on, uh, on the language of the underlying investment treaty, they can either go into national courts and request uh, remedies before the national courts or alternatively, uh, alternatively, they can pursue criminal proceedings for for the for the fact of the corruption if if that's what they're seeking relief in respect of. Our next question is: um, What evidence is usually offered when proving corruption allegations? Because corruption is often discreet and difficult to prove. That's actually very true, and that's uh, that's something, as you've seen, a lot of tribunals agree with you on as well, that corruption is very hard to prove, it's typically covert, and evidence of it is, is, is nearly impossible. Now, we, now, there are only two successful cases that we're, that we're aware of in the international arbitra investment arbitration space, and in both those cases, um, the evidence of corruption was fairly clear. In one case, uh, Mr. Ali in uh, World Duty Free basically admitted it and included it in his, in his witness statement. So he made things fairly simple for the party. But um, in Metal Tech, I think uh, it was a slightly more investigative process where they looked at a bunch of consultancy agreements. Uh, they read through those agreements and then analyzed the qualifications of, uh, of the people with whom uh, the consultancy agreements were entered into to question whether those people were actually qualified to provide the services included in the consultancy agreements, to then think about whether the services itself were worth the amount that was actually being paid for it and so on, and uh, to sort of connect the thoughts using uh, the red flags argument. And you may want to also look at uh, Lord Wolf's explanation. Wolf is spelled with a double O. Lord Wolf's explanation on uh, the red flags analysis explaining what kind of red flags actually constitute indicia of corruption. In other cases like NICO, I think it's also useful to keep an eye out and, and look into other, other jurisdictions. Like for example, Bangladesh got a hold of the plea bargain that was signed by NICO's parent company in Canada in a plea bargain and in the course of uh, corruption investigation and bribery investigation in, in that jurisdiction in Canada. And they relied on admissions made in that context, in the investment arbitration context. Um, 
bribery laws exist everywhere in the world and they're and they're fairly strongly enforced in most jurisdictions so if there is corruption for example in country a it's likely that the party uh, may be may being may be investigated in by its own home state by in other states and so on so i think it's also worth at least in the international context to look at admissions of corruption or allegations of corruption in other jurisdictions and sort of tying that together to build to build an argument uh, in terms of evidence. I hope that's helpful. I think the questions have zoomed ahead, so I can't see if you have a follow-up question. Um, yes, yeah. the next question is, um, what would be the consequence <clears throat> of an act corruption, um, which has been attributed to the state? Is there a convention indemnifying states from responsibility? Uh, state immunity is actually, states do have immunity in a number of proceedings and they can actually avail of, that's actually a very good question. Uh, states can avail of their immunity in a number of proceedings and states actually can't be um, brought into proceedings uh, without actually having the chance to represent themselves. You should look at the monetary gold principle and you should, you should look at that case and that will give you some understanding of how the kind of immunity that states enjoy. Uh, but but in this context, uh, and more to your question as to what can happen in the event uh, an act of a public official is actually attributed to the state, it may have changed the course of, for example, world duty free versus Kenya, where if President Moy's solicitation of the bribe had actually been attributed to Kenya, Kenya wouldn't have been able to rely on that argument to resist jurisdiction because it would effectively be taking advantage of its own wrong. And that would have been the first wrong rather than the payment of the bribe, if you, if you follow my uh, line of argument. So the attribution of those wrongs to states can actually lead, for cons lead to consequences for the state, and that can actually uh, uh, be used by claimants. Uh, you may want to review EDF versus Romania as well, because in that case, the claimant refused to pay the bribe and the claimant argued that the state demanding the bribe itself was a breach of the fair and equitable treatment standard that was contained in the investment treaty, in the underlying investment treaty. And those kinds of arguments can be made. So that itself, the making of the bribe by the state and the attribution of that bribe, of the solicitation of the bribe to the state can form the basis of a claim in investment arbitration. It hasn't been successful so far, but it, it in theory, if it can be attributed, that would be, that would be one of the consequences. Um, the next question is, is ICSID equipped to prosecute corrupt individuals or is there, a, or is there any provision in ICSID regulatory fr framework to force the state to prosecute the corrupt officials? Um, no, there isn't. Um, in ICSID jurisdiction, typically, uh, you can only sue states in ICSID jurisdiction and you can only sue, sue states that are party to the ICSID convention. Uh, or the additional facility. So that may, so this suing individuals before the exit is not an option. You can't prosecute corrupt officials before the exit and the exit can't actually uh, require, uh, require that either. Um, is an ICSID award subject to non-recognition in a national court based on public policy, like non-arbitrability of corruption slash fraud matters, even when parties agree to exclude the jurisdiction of national courts in their contact, in their contract? So the thing about ICSID, ICSID awards is that it's different from New York Convention awards because New York Convention awards are subject, uh, of course, to, uh, to can be subject to the public policy round of analysis. But ICSID awards are final and binding when they're passed. And the only challenge that you can, that you can make to, the, to an ICSID award is on, on a very limited set of grounds. And you can only make that challenge to the ICSID ad hoc committee rather than uh, under the typical New York convention kind of paradigm. So in that sense, it is very different from the kind of cases that you're thinking of uh, in this question. So that may be something to go back and sort of think about and sort of uh, understand the difference between uh, ICSID arbitration versus uh, arbitration that's enforceable under the New York Convention. Um, 
do we have any more questions? Um, if you take the last few questions, yeah. In any case, going under national court's jurisdiction provide a bias against the investor. Um, that is that is a like that's a recurring theme uh, in ongoing debates that states often consider that, or well, investors often consider that proceeding against a state or a state entity before the national courts involves a certain degree of bias against the investor. Uh, and that is an argument that is often taken up in subsequent investment arbitration proceedings. For example, there, there can be a denial of justice argument that's been made or a denial of just, uh, justice argument is typically, can typically be made when uh, an investor has tried uh, for years together to seek relief and remedy before the national courts of the state and uh, they're not, and it's simply unable to avail of, uh, of relief. It can't, it can't challenge the analysis itself of the national courts, but if it doesn't actually have uh, any means to actually seek, uh, seek remedies, uh, it can make a denial of benefits kind of argument in as part of its, uh, as part of its claim uh, in exit arbitration or in other kinds of arbitration. Uh, and, and you can't rule out uh, the, the argument about there being some sort of bias against the investor, especially if, if a certain regime or if a certain, ju or a certain judicial system is not as independent as, as some others. Uh, there is an argument to be made that the investor uh, can face bias, can face, can come up against quite a, quite a hard line that's been taken by uh, a state's organs, including its judicial arm. Uh, I think I may have missed the second bit of your question. Yes, so after national courts, an, an investor can go to the exit, but it can go to the exit only if there is no fork in the road clause. So you have to be careful to look at the underlying treaty to ensure that there is no fork in the road clause. And if there is a fork in the road clause, then that's sort of, uh, you've sort of written away your, uh, your, your right to bring a claim in investment arbitration if you choose to go before the national courts. But if there isn't a fork in the road clause, then of course uh, you can then uh, bring your claim to investment arbitration thereafter. Does that answer your question, Ms. Ba? Yeah. All right, so there any um, last questions we've taken? Otherwise, we'll close off the session. Okay, um, I think then we can uh, say goodbye. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Mesh. Thank you, all the attendees, and a special thank you to Anas and Abhay Pachari for helping organize and being so cooperative. Um, it's been a very enlightening session. And thank you very much, Mr. Mesh. Of course, and thank you so much for having me. Thank you to Spill and to Inalp for having me. Thank you.